Okay. okay. So let's get ready to welcome our next speaker, Alba. I don't know if you noticed that um, after the morning I stopped saying people's surnames after being scolded. <laughs> Come on stage, Alba. Let's give Alba a big round of applause. Um, I've been told that she's a huge fan of potatoes and apparently had, um, had prepared a, a PVA uh, that lets you generate random potatoes based on the daily mood. Uh, <laughs> if you are interested, a good question for her later on is to share the URL, so you can also try the app. You can just press quit. What? And <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's the clicker. Okay. Okay, right. let's give another round of applause for Alba. Yeah, one moment because, yeah. <laughs> My keyboard. <laughs> okay. uh, I guess quit. Okay, <laughs> nice. The stage is all yours. <laughs> Thank you. <Oof. laughs> what well, is my first talk too? I think I'm not the only one today, so now I'm less nervous because we are all in this together. <laughs> and well, my talk is about image optimization, but with a Pokemon touch. So I'm saying Pokemon, because I'm Spanish, but I think it's Pokemon. So I just learned it being here in Italy. It's really funny. Okay, so uh, if you scan that QR, you can have the slides in your phone just in case you don't see any code or whatever, you can zoom in or zoom out, but it's okay. Okay, so I can introduce a little bit myself. I'm Alba Silvente, a developer relations engineer at the Storyblock, as you can see in the slide, but also in this huge banner here. So <laughs> basically, my work now is talking, conference, and giving workshops. So for that, I'm here right now. And I'm training, so it's my first talk for that. And you can find me in any social media and trials. And I'm part of these programs that you can see here. But it, yeah, it's a lot, so let's skip it. OK, so uh, in this talk, I want to introduce you a little bit in web performance, in image optimization, but also in the Jamstack ecosystem, because maybe some of you didn't work yet with Jamstack. But Nax is a framework that also generates the static sites. And for that, uh, we will use it for this demo. And basically, I will explain you the optimization techniques you have for image uh, optimization, but also how to solve all these problems with an image service, or image CDN also called. And we will see a little case study with an image component in view, three with a script setup. And yeah, let's start with this. So the idea is uh, today we are creating a lot of content online, storing a lot of data. And big companies like Google or Netlify or any hosting providers were seeking for solutions that help us to achieve uh, lighter websites and also uh, make them faster because otherwise we will be creating a lot of data but uh, storing something that maybe is not usable for the user. So they start seeking solutions like the Jamstack architecture and also the Core Web Vitals metrics. So we all uh, start creating really web performance sites and for that today web performance is as important as uh, and as trendy as having an online, an online presence. Otherwise your product will not be seen. So. What is web performance? So web performance, as you may know, uh, is just referring to the speed at which a website loads, how fast it's downloaded by the user, and how an app is displayed in the user's browser. So basically, it's the objective measurement, so all the metrics that we have in the Core Web Vitals, but also how the users perceive the application. Because maybe you have really good Core Web Vitals, but it is not interactive at all for the user. So that's a problem. So improving that, you will have a lot of users coming to your site and also better positions in the search engines. So it's really important that we are up to date with these techniques. And what is the relation between images and web performance? Well, as you can see here in this data that is coming from the Web Manac report, 90% of the pages have an image tag. And 99% have at least one image request because they are maybe using it as a background image. So the idea is that if you don't improve your images, you will have a bad uh, performance, basically. So now is when it comes into the picture, the image optimization. It's just how to render an image perfectly for each device or viewport. So each time we are rendering an image in a phone, it could be different from a desktop, but also from different phones, you will have different density pixels. So you will have different images too. So you need to optimize everything for that image in any device and viewport that is out there. 
but for that, we will see a lot of techniques today, so don't worry about that. You will have a, a solution for each problem you will face. And basically, uh, not only for any website, but also for the Jamstack ecosystem, it's really important to have optimized your images because as well as Manac address in the image section of the Jamstack report, basically the images are the main bottleneck for the good UX. So basically all the Jamstack sites we have online, the problem is in the images because everything is static. So there is no problem with JavaScript, no problem with HTML, just the images. So we need to solve that problem and make the core web vitals metrics right, just changing our images. So basically, if you don't know Jamstack, Jamstack is just an architectural approach that was named by Nellify, but we were using for a lot of years. Basically, it's just the coupling, the backend from the front end, so calling to a REST API and having the front end in another project, separating them and not having it in a, in a monorepo, let's say. So now that we have this kind of techniques, we can use uh, NAX as a static site generator and start creating our site the static, but with dynamic technology, let's say. So for that, Jamstack comes into the picture, and as you can see, if you see the report in the, in the right side, basically all the static site generators, the adoption of the image format is basically no, because they are using all formats instead of compressing better the images. So the main problem of the Jamstack sites is the image optimization. It's not well done, basically. So for that, we need to think about the image optimization techniques we have nowadays that Google and a lot of companies are working hard on that. And also the MDN uh, documentation is working on helping us how to make these optimization techniques happen. And basically here we will see one solution for each, per each problem we will face while working with images, but also mix with an ability of a Pokemon. Why? Because there is a lot of abilities of the Pokemons that are related to one optimization technique, and you will see now. So basically, the first problem we will face while working with images is the use of larger image files. So the large image files will slow down web pages, which generate poor score performance for sure, and also bad UX. In the right image, you can see a Lighthouse report that basically is complaining about that. It's a huge payload, but this time it's not a JavaScript file, as always we can see in the report. This time it's just an image. So the solution here is really simple. We need to compress and reduce the size of our images and the, their files. So basically you can think about it like you are catching a Pokemon and you have a catch rate. So in order to catch that Pokemon, you need the perfect optimal catch rate. So the same you need to do with the images. To represent an image the same way you have it in the first place, you need to put the compression rate, the optimal one for that specific device and viewport. So for that, we have two different techniques. The velocity compression that will be for really images that are not that important in the website or maybe for Twitter or any social medias that are not using that much images, so you can just compress them, lose quality, and it will be good enough. And what it matters is the performance. But then you have the case of Instagram or Unsplash or these websites that are focused on images. If you want to represent that image, it should be with better quality. So for that, you have the lossless compression. And basically, changing these compression rates, you will have better quality in one case or another. And to do that, we have tools that can help you manually. If you are saving the, the images inside your GitHub repositories, you have, for example, the Calibre image action that is just a GitHub action that will compress the images in pull request in your repos or the image vault. So these logos that you have here are links. You can click on them, and it will go to the project. So you can take a look because they are open source project, and you can also use these compression techniques. But basically, why? complicate things if we have already technology that are doing that for us. So now we have an image CDN, or an image service, we can call it. So it's just a combination of a transformation API that what it's doing is just changing some parameters in the URL of the image and give it that image optimized already for you. But also, you have a CDN network there that is just catching all the images, so the user will just get another copy of the image that is really fast. So if you are using an image CDN, it's easier that you optimize your images on the fly instead of doing it manually per each image. And in the Jamstack ecosystem, it's even easier because every Hello CMS you use to build your site has already an image service provided by for you. And in this case, as you can see, I'm using the Storyblock one that basically 
is making the same as any image service. You can use Cloudinary, you can use Imagine, whatever you, you see the logos there, you can use whatever. But if you use a story block, you just need to add a slash M at the end of the image, and it will compress it for you. And if you want a better compression rate, you can change it by the quality filter. But that's it. Basically, adding M to your file, you will have it compressed and optimized. You don't need to do anything else. Then the next uh, problem we face while working with images is the older image formats. So basically, every image online is using JPEG and PNG nowadays. When we have WebP and Aviv and other formats that are trendy nowadays, so basically, we are having worse performance and worse compression because we are not using the new uh, trendy formats. But basically, we just need to use them. <laughs> they are there. And to reduce the file size of our image considerably, because they have a really compression rate compared with the others, we just need to use them. And you can compare them to the Muse transformability that basically the images will just transform to another format that will be the same at the end. So you will have your images the same way that they look, but this time with a better compression. And all the benefits that you get from WebP and Aviv are obvious because you will see the numbers there. But also you have better support for WebP, and for that now Aviv is kind of trendy because it's really cool, but it's not enough for all the browsers. So for that, uh, at the moment, all the image service, like the storybook one, will just compress to WebP because it's not a stable, the Aviv one. But once it is, all the image service will be adding it. And you can see here that just adding the M, I told you, is also compressing by default to WebP, and only if the browser supports. But then you can change the format manually if you want with the filter format. And then you will have your image in the next generation formats, and your optimization will be the best one. And then once you have that, uh, you, you will think that maybe, yeah, you just compress your images, that is the basic stuff, but then some other things will happen, like the unspecified dimensions. Well, some years ago, we started removing the height and width from the images because it was trendy, like, don't doing it and just uh, adding the size in the CSS. But then, again, they start providing us these attributes like something compulsory. So now we need to add them because if you don't add them, the browser doesn't know the aspect ratio of the image. They will render just a line, zero height, and then everything will start dropping when the image loads. So you can see in the video here, if I click on the play, you will see the laggy face. So that layout shift is causing because we didn't specify the image weight and height. And it seems uh, obvious, but not everyone is using it nowadays. So we need to, what you, we need to do is just, wait, I don't know why, okay. So what we need to do is just add the width and height attributes. So the same way Pikachu with the Dynamax ability just transforms himself into a bigger place, changing the world ar around them, we need to change the page around the image, just specifying the width and height. It's that simple. But actually, as it seems that simple for us, for the browser, it's a tedious job that they made for us. Just uh, they are calculating each time you are adding the width and height, everything that you have in your CSS, in your HTML tags, in the picture tag. So now we don't need only to add the width and height to the image tag. We also need to add it in the search tags in the picture because they can be different aspect ratios, and we need to specify that in HTML. So basically, we have two scenarios. One is when we have a size uh, of the container and we want the image to be the wider that the container is when you are just making the web wider or less wider. So when you do that, you need to specify in your CSS height auto, but the height of the image should be on the tag. Otherwise, the browser will not know the height and will put height zero by default. So you need to specify it. But then you have another case, that is when you are using the art direction technique that is basically having a different image per uh, device, Basically, you need to specify also the different aspect ratios. Otherwise, the browser will represent always the image tag instead of the different source that you have in the picture tag. So you need to specify always the, the width and height, and don't forget about it. Then when you already fix all this problem, most of the issues are solved. 
unless you have really huge images in desktop, like a banner, and then in mobile they are like just a square. So for that problem, uh, you will have this not optimized for the device error that is thrown by Lighthouse. And basically, if we scale an image without having it previously optimized for that usage in a specific, we will make the browser load an image with an inadequate size or quality. So to solve that is really simple. We just need to use responsive images. So the responsive images offer different versions of an image to the browser so that they determine which image loads based on the user screen size or device features. So now it's time uh, to activate the image heavy metal ability so we can amplify the width of our image. And for that use case, as we are changing the width descriptors, the idea is that what we need to do is just change the resolution per device, so the 1x, 2x that you can see there are just the density descriptors, and you need to specify which image you want to load per each density. So when you are using a, a resolution of a iPhone, will be more than a normal Android, for example. So there in the source set, you will specify all this data, and then the source will work as a fallback and will be used only if that doesn't work, and that's it. And then we have another problem with the responsive images that are not sized appropriately per the device. So when, we, when large images intended for desktop are shown in mobile, they cost a lot of data, for sure, and from mobile to desktop, they lose quality. So we need to, again, use the responsive images, but this time to properly resize the, Im the original image according to the viewport size. And when we think of responsive sizes, we think on the evolution of the Pokemon when they don't change the form, they just change the size of the Pokemon. So this is kind of the thing we need to do. So we just, uh, as we can see here, we just need to change in the source set instead of using the density descriptors, use the width descriptors. So we will use just an image per each of the width that the image will represent in the viewport. So the sizes property is an optional parameter, but it seems that everyone is using it, but it's optional because with the sizes, you just need to specify which kind of width will occupy the image in the viewport, but not the width of the screen, just the viewport of the image. And then it will represent different images from the source set, but it's not needed. You can use just the source set and it will work fine. So once you have that, you think, well, I will not do all these images manually. Of course not. You have the image service. You can just pass some parameters to the URL, in this case, the width and the height. And of course, as we are not changing the aspect ratio, we just can pass the width and then a zero for the height, and it will resize our images on the fly. So we can make all this combination by code and forget about it. And if each time someone will load an uh, image in our site, it will be uh, auto-compressed because we are using the image service. And the last problem about image uh, resizing is basically the change of design. When we are working with designers and also marketers, we also have different images with text. And this is a problem because in mobile they are cropped always. So we need to have a solution for that. We just need to add different images per device and not different size of the same image. So to do that, we need to use the picture tag, as we always know. So basically, using the source, as I told you, specifying the width and height so they know exactly the aspect ratio of that image, you will have different images per device, and you will have a proper image. And you can think about it like the evolution of the Pokemon, the real evolution, when they change completely the form. So basically, this is the relation between Pokemon and the art direction, when they change completely their form to showcase all the abilities that they have. And once we end with all the responsive images, we, om we are almost done. But there are some things that are happening nowadays, and it's because we are always using lazy loading for everything, and that's a problem. <laughs> Why? Because the, we need to load all the images that above the fold before the critical resources, but not the ones below the fold. So every time we are making lazy loading, we are lazy loading our images below the fold, but also the above the fold, and no, that's not how it works. What we need to do is use the loading property with the eager solution for the above the fold, and then the loading for the above the fold. 
Once you have that, you have a kind of a Snorlax that when you scroll your images, then they start awaking like you are playing music to Snorlax. So the idea is that using this property joined with the hint preload that we have nowadays, we can just get our images faster from the image service CDM, but also from the browser. So combining the hint with the loading lazy property, we can make our website really fast and don't load something that is not in the viewport of the user. And the last thing that we have when working with images is the cache. Basically, if you are making everything manually, you have your images stored in your GitHub repository. This could be a really tricky thing because you will need to implement everything for caching the images. But the good thing with an image service is that it's making it for us. So basically, when we want to catch our images in the client, Nax will do it for us. And if we want to make it in the server, the image service CDN will make it for us. So the solution is just to use the slash M, and that's catching everything. So you don't need to add anything else. And if you think about it, it's like the copycat move of Pokemon that caused the user to get the last move. So basically, the last image you represent to them. And now that you have everything, let's see how we can implement this using Vue, Vue 3 with a screen setup, headless CMS story block, and the image service that he's provided. But actually, I use Nax3, but only for creating the project, let's say, but the Vue component is enough. So basically, what I do to create this project is just create a component inside the headless that is expecting all the properties that we see in the optimization techniques. So instead of doing it everything in our code, we can create a component in the headless with all the width, height, the responsive size, everything that we need, but creating presets. So each time we want to create a banner, we have already a preset of that component with all the values for that specific banner. So in this case, we can see that we have two components. The design image, that is just basically the art direction ones, so the ones that you want per device, and then the normal image. That is just the whole image that we will represent as basic in desktop. So you will represent there all the parameters, and then in your code, you will start defining them. The first foundation part of the image component is just creating the basic stuff. The image tag, a picture without sources, because we are not using art direction yet, then representing the original image and creating a function that will map all the parameters to the URL to have the image service working and to have all the parameters uh, there, the width and the height. Once we have the foundation, we just need to add the lazy loading parameter. So in this case, I'm adding the property from the hell CMS instead of adding it manually. Why? Because then there we can plan what we want to be eager and what we want to be lazy. And there you can play with the presets, and that's it. So each time they are creating an image in the article that is on top, they will be already eager in the headless, and they, don't, they can change it. And then in the code, will be represented automatically, so we don't need to worry about it. And then when working with responsive images, it's kind of the same. We will have a property inside the, the headless that is just basically adding the width of the uh, expected images by comma, so we can just render them, and we can just, as you can see in the code, just make the call to the method that will map all this data to the image service. And in that moment, we have it, everything rendered by, by default. Then the density descriptor will be kind of the same, but this time we are using checkbox. Why? Because if we want to support all the density descriptors we have, we just need to check them. And then in that moment, we will add a new property for that, so the sources know about all the density descriptors we want to use. But of course, it's not mandatory if you are not worried about that. And then the art direction one, that will be just add a source for each of the images we are adding in the design image component we created in the headless. So it's time we create one, it will create a source dynamically. And basically, just a simple project with four images. The first result it's ugly. I mean, I didn't have anything more than four images, and already this score was really bad. Just using the component, you have everything 100% uh, as it should be, because you are using just four images. It's not that much. So you can see the results are really bad if you have really not optimized images. So just start implementing these techniques that are really simple, and it's just a couple of lines, and you will have everything working. 
So in case you want to see the demo project that is basically the, the one on the right side, you can duplicate the story block space with the image component I showed you that I created in the Helldesk. You can see the GitHub repository that is open source and the live site demo so you can play with them and see how they are responsive. And of course, uh, this talk is made because I write an article of 41 minutes reading. I know it's so long, but yeah, it, it cost me months to write it, actually. And it's a guide to optimization uh, of images in Jamstack sites. So just following this guide, you will have everything you need to optimize your images. And that's it. So thank you so much. And sorry if I talk too fast, because yeah, I'm really nervous. <laughs> but it's OK. <laughs> if you have any feedback, you have the card there, and you can leave me. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should go another round of applause. <laughs> Any question? Over there. Microphone, in microphone incoming. Uh, first of all, thank you for the speech, super interesting. Uh, and uh, seems like a Storyblock image service is uh, managing every kind of uh, uh, feature and aspect of image optimization. So when you use uh, this kind of uh, CMS backend uh, and use a uh, um, framework like Nuxt for the front end, you still need a module like Nuxt image or not? Yeah, actually, the image component I built is just, um, let's say that the image tag is doing the same as the next image model. The problem with the next image model is that each time you want to use it, you need to upgrade the version. And maybe they broke something, and you need to change it. So basically, if you build your own, uh, you are sure that it's working and optimized for your service provider, exactly. So that's why I build my own. But of course, you can use Nuxt image or any other kind of image component that you have online. OK, but uh, mm, the question was, uh, if you use Storyblock uh, for, the, for the image, uh, a module like the official uh, no, Nuxt uh, image module, it's uh, redundant or? Yeah, they have a provider section, at least in the NAS image module, that you can use to connect to Storyblock. But you will start sending the parameters with a property name that they created for that property. So yeah, that's the thing. You can make it, but creating your own method, you are aware of what parameters you are sending. And I think it's better to see than when you pass down some properties that they have created for that provider. OK, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any more questions? OK, I do have two. Let's start with the serious one. Of <laughs> the so, <serious> <laughs> <laughs> so you showed us a lot of techniques. Um, if we had time to work and implement only one, what is the most impactful that we should work on? <laughs> only one. <laughs> I think all of them are important, but the width and height, for sure. Because if the browser doesn't know about your image, yeah, the laggy stuff that the user will see is really disappointed. Because if you are going to press a button and then an image appears, then the button goes off and you didn't click the right place. So yeah, I think width and height is the most important one. OK, perfect. And now the non-serious one. We saw a lot of Pokemon. <laughs> Which one is your favorite? Well, I think it's kind of obvious. Yeah, uh, Bulbasaur. Yeah. OK. <laughs> it wasn't there, though, in any of the slides. Yeah, actually, no, because they are abilities. No, yeah. <laughs> Not Pokemon. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Any other question in the meantime? Yes, over there. <laughs> hey, thanks, Salva. That was great. Um, just wondering, are any of these techniques useful when working with SVGs? Is it something that we would have to worry about in terms of optimization for them, or are they kind of separate? Yeah, actually, I didn't talk about SVGs, because usually the best thing you can do is add the SVG to the page and not add it as an image. That will be my recommendation. Usually, 
the only thing I didn't talk about that maybe is important is that WebP can also compress video and maybe, well, and animated images like GIFs. So I think that's better to do it with WebP, but for example, for SVGs, I would just leave the SVG a series in the HTML and not make it an image, yeah. Thanks for the question. Over there. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Okay. And I would like to ask you, um, how do you deal uh, with um, the aspect ratio? I elaborate more. Like, um, I don't know uh, from back end uh, what the aspe aspect ratio will be of the image. Um, uh, sometimes maybe it's like uh, horizontal, four third, and sometimes 69 uh, vertical. Uh, there is a technique to deal with that or? Yeah, actually, uh, it depends on what are you using, but in the image uh, of Story Blog, when you are saving it, uh, it returns actually the size of the image in the URL, and you can map it and get the width and the height from that. But what I did in the component is specify the width and the height, so the marketing or the design team can specify with height and width they want for that image. Because maybe they want to place an image like a square, but the image, when they upload them, is a different image, I mean, a larger one. So they need to specify the width and height in that case. So for that, when you are, for example, creating a banner, let's specify the bigger size that they can have in width and height, and then provide them in the component. And then in the component, you will start cropping them if, it, if needed for other device. But the first aspect ratio, you define it by yourself. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Okay, it seems there is no other question, so let's give another <laughs> round of applause to Alba.